I'm going to introduce Gwen Bookman, who is the co-chair of the Arusha Committee of Sister Cities of Durham. In her other life, she is the director of the Center for Global Studies at Bennett College. Welcome with me, Ms. Bookman. Thank you. Once again, we are so pleased to have you with us this afternoon, and we hope this will be an exciting experience for you. I am going to take a small amount of time to talk to you about Sister Cities in general. How many of you are familiar with Sister Cities? All right, that's great. Sister Cities has been one of the most engaging community service activities that I've participated in. I am currently the co-chair, as you've been told, of the Arusha Committee. But I want to tell you a little bit about the other committees that uh, uh, Sister Cities also has work possibilities for you to do. And part of what we do with these programs is not only to engage you in the work that we are doing, but also hopefully interesting you in engaging as a member of Sister Cities. Uh, there are actually five sister cities currently in full operation. You'll get a chance later on today to hear very in detail what we do with the Arusha Committee. But in addition to Arusha, I want you to know a little bit about the others. There is, of course, a sister city in Durham, UK. And that would be almost a given that if you are Durham, North Carolina, that you would reach out around the world and find those other sisters. Uh, cities are uh, also named Durham, and we have been in relationship with uh, Durham, UK. Uh, really, one of our earliest, if not the earliest, sister city engagement we've had. We've been a sister city with Durham, UK since 1975. Uh, in addition to the Durham, UK committee, we have a sister city in Kostroma, Russia. We've been sister cities there since 1989. We have a sister city relationship with Toyama, Japan. And we've been a sister city with them also since 1989. Our newest sister city is Zuzhou, China. And we began sister cities with uh, Zuzhou in 2012. One of the things that's been very exciting for us about Zuzhou is that it joins with us in our friendship city in Kunshan, China, and we began a friendship city with Kunshan in 2013. For though, how many of you um, have been out to the Duke Gardens and have experienced the gardens there? There's a beautiful one with the Japanese pavilion. We're in the process right now of working in conjunction with Duke to create a China pavilion as well. Our Kunshan Sister City began as a result of uh, Duke's campus location there. I don't know how many of you are aware that Duke has a full-fledged campus in Kunshan. So there are lots and lots of ways that the Sister Cities program intersects with other organizations in uh, the city of Durham to really make our presence around the world known. Uh, one thing that you might need to know about these is that they are official relationships. The uh, sister city process begins mayor to mayor. So literally it is a choice of the sister cities to join with Durham and the relationship begins by the mayor of the city agreeing that this is a project that the mayor would like to be involved in. And each of the committees works pretty independently in terms of how it goes forward with its relationships. Uh, as you may know, the cities are completely dependent upon the citizens in each of the cities to make the relationship work. That's why it is so important for us when we have these programs to entice those of you who are not already involved to become involved because these relationships only work when the cities, citizens in each of the cities puts uh, effort in to make them uh, operable. The one that you're here to talk about today and to learn about is of course our relationship with Arusha, Tanzania. Arusha has been a sister city with Durham since 1991. How many of you have been to 
First of all, let's start with Africa. How many of you have been to Africa? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have been to Tanzania in specifically? And now how many of you have actually been to Arusha? Great. Well, this is a very interactive program. We have people here who've been to Arusha. We actually have a young man in the back who is from Tanzania. He's actually from Moshe, so he will be able to also chime in and add some wonderful things to what we're gonna talk about. Um, there's material in the back that situates Tanzania for you and situates Arusha for you, so I hope all of you were able to pick that up. Uh, the map that is the most uh, in detail is this one, which not only is a map of Tanzania in, in, as a whole, it also shows you the capital city, Dar es Salaam. It also shows you uh, Zanzibar, which is off the coast and became uh, part of Tanzania when Tanzania moved from being Tanganyika. Uh, Tanganyika. What I'm going to do now is introduce and bring up my co-chair, uh, Dr. Victoria Thornton, who will give you a little bit more of a travel log about uh, Tanzania and about Arusha, and she will uh, introduce herself a little bit more in terms of the things that she has done. So please join me in welcoming Victoria Thornton. Thank you all. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to talk with you about the work that I've been able to do with the Arusha Committee of Sister Cities of Durham over the last several years. And I have to tell you that that work has really been in combination with another organization that looks to try to build bridges and to do work not only here in the United States but also internationally. And that's the Durham chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. So I'm also the vice president of that organization, but have chaired the International Trends and Services Committee of that organization. And that's kind of how I got started, because one of our alumna members started out almost from the beginning with Sister Cities of Durham and the Arusha Committee. So we uh, looked to try to work on projects where we could bring attention to the needs of women because we partner here in Durham with Genesis Home, which is uh, a home, a shelter, or temporary transitional housing for women and families, and men and families. It was the first shelter here in Durham that would take families. And oftentimes when women leave wherever they're living, they leave with a group of children. And there was no one before Genesis where, who could take them in. So we wanted to kind of bring recognition to the fact that some of the same problems that we might encounter for families here in Durham are the same ones that are encountered in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, as you heard Dr. Bookman say, um, Tanzania was a colony of Britain until 1964. And it was composed of the mainland country uh, Tanganyika and two islands, Zanzibar and Pemba. Uh, Julius Nyeri led the fight for independence and was the first president of Tanzania. And this was considered such a prominent event that he was featured on the cover of Time magazine when that took place. So the country is now called formally the United Republic of Tan Tanzania. And they have a beautiful coat of arms which appears on one of the handouts that you may have picked up from the back. Their motto, um, and I'm not gonna try to say this, but maybe Brian will help me out. They are Swahili words for freedom and unity. Brian, can you help me out with that? Uru na umoja? Okay, uru na moja, na umoja. And so that's basically what they base their creed on, uh, freedom and unity. And, uh, the sphere at the center of that uh, shield stands for defense with a crossed ax and a hoe that are the tools they use to cultivate the land because they are an agricultural land also. The wavy lines at the bottom of the shield in blue and white stand for the coast, the land, and the lakes of Tanzania. 
The man and the woman each carry an ivory tusk, which symbolizes the wildlife of the country. At the man's feet, a clove bush signifies the main product of Zanzibar, while the cotton bush near the woman represents a major product of Tanganyika, what was formerly known as Tanganyika. So Arusha sits very near to Mount Kilimanjaro, which is one of the foremost known uh, sites for tourism uh, in Tanzania. It is the highest freestanding mountain in the world and is one of the seven summits. Uh, it was the site of where Julius Neri declared his policy of self-reliance in 1967, wherein it was reaffirmed that Tanzanians desire freedom in all aspects for themselves and for all Africans. And this has led to this shared concept of diversity and freedom of diversity within the country. The Arusha district or the Arusha city has an estimated population of 1,228,000, at least in the 2007 census, which is the best I had access to. Although the city itself now has about 575,000 residents. It's surrounded by some of Africa's most famous landscapes and national parks. It's the host and capital of the East African community, which is composed of Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. And it served as the host and location of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda when those trials took place. The majority of the Tanzanian population is Arab Tanzanian and Indian Tanzanian peoples. There is a small white European and white American minority population. The religions represented include Catholics, Anglicans. The Anglicans have a significant missionary there, and I'll talk with you more about how we work with them. Uh, Jewish, Muslims, and Hindus. The major industries include banking, tire production, agricultural and forest processing, pharmaceutical manufacturing, and tourism. Uh, the United States sister cities include Durham, North Carolina, and Kansas City, Missouri. Sister Cities of Durham, as you heard from Dr. Bookman, is a volunteer nonprofit organization that promotes international friendship, intercultural understanding, and economic development. Uh, world peace is viewed as one friendship and one community at a time. And you've heard about the sister cities that we have. Both the Durham and the Triangle Park chapters of the Lynx Incorporator have partnered with sister cities of Durham on several projects involving Arusha. One is support for the orphans in the Arusha community. As many of you know, there are uh, orphans who have lost their parents to the HIV AIDS epidemic and crisis in Africa. Most of those orphans uh, are adopted by other family members, but those family members then have, do not have the financial resources to send them to school. So even though uh, they may attend a public school or what we consider a public school in Arusha, they must still wear uniforms, shoes, sweaters, pay fees, and have school books. So we have worked to try to support those orphans. It's usually about $80 a year in order to fund an orphan to go to school annually. And that project's been going on now for about 12 years. Um, we also worked with the Duke Center for Documentary Studies to provide disposable cameras for the use of the students and the teachers. The teachers used the cameras to take photos of objects that they used in their teaching lessons. The students took photos of themselves and their surroundings to learn more about their way of life and share it with us. So the Duke doc Documentary Studies actually had an exhibit showing the children's photos, the teachers' photos, and they called that literacy through photography. And that project continues now to be funded uh, by a federal grant. Um, and they have gone throughout the country teaching teachers how to use photography at, and incorporate it in their teaching. Um, there are several other projects that we've worked on. One was 
we encouraged a sewing group called the Zabibu Group, which was founded by our partners in Arusha, who are called the Friends of Arusha. They're a local community organizing committee. And uh, so instead of having to purchase uniforms for the orphan children, we now have a group who can sew them and make them for them. Because the uniforms, one of the, the high prices uh, that we were paying for the uniforms was because they were imported. So now we have a group making them for themselves and we're hoping that they'll also be able to engage orders with other schools and then have a little cottage industry where they're making clothing for other school children. Um, they were additionally involved in a quilt project. Uh, I don't know how many of you came to the library last year. Were any of you here for the quilt project? last year, uh, we had each of our sister cities made a quilt. And the quilts are now on display in the lobby of City Hall. And they have descriptions beside them. So you can go and look at them anytime. But they're very representative of the things that are important in the cultures of all of those sister cities. And particularly Arusha, you'll see that there's a display of uh, the Maasai warrior, the Maasai blanket. It's very, very typical of what they see and do in their everyday life. Uh, and the sewing group was able to help in that, that project. Uh, in addition, over the last three years, we have been working to help to build a medical clinic in the ward of the city called Daraja in Bili. Daraja in Bili is one of the most impoverished areas of the city of Arusha. And they had no services, no medical services in that ward for women or children. And particularly for women who needed maternity services, it's been very difficult because they have to travel a long ways across the city, usually right at the time of delivery, um, to get to a clinic that can help them. So we started uh, this project with the help of a grant. Uh, the building now is virtually completed. We will be looking very soon to partner with others to equip the building and to form a partnership with physicians from Durham to help with the training of health professionals there in Arusha. Um, so these are the kinds of projects that we try to take on. Uh, we've also had another project that looks at an exchange between students in our schools here in Durham, specifically at Riverside High School, as well as at um, uh, a school, a girls' school called St. Joseph's School in Arusha. Brian, do you know that school? No? I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name sitting next to you. You grew up in Arusha, correct? So St. Joseph's is a girls' school. I think it's called St. Joseph's Inga Renono School. But that is the school that we have instituted these cyber exchanges with. So they've had Skype sessions. They've exchanged information using DVDs. Um, they've uh, had chat sessions. Um, they've used the email system and the um, system that is approved by Durham Public Schools to exchange information. So that we try to partner uh, with all different parts of our community, with all different parts of the community in Arusha. Uh, we have another member of our committee who's here now who recently made a trip to Arusha. Um, her name, at least as we knew her, is Rhonda Pierce. She recently married uh, a Tanzanian gentleman who is also a member of our community, Tony Intiro Galegua. And so she is now Rhonda Intiro Galegua, and she's going to present some information to you from her recent travels to Arusha. Any questions before I step down about information, the brief information I shared with you? OK, there will be time for more questions at the end also. Rhonda? Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, if someone wanted to contribute to help with the, the $80 for the school, how would one do that? Through Sister Cities? Through Sister Cities, yes. Sister. We uh, 
Do we collect the money from all of our donors? We have individual donors as well as organizational contributors, and then we forward that money to the Anglican Mothers Union, it's called. So this is a group of Anglican missionaries who have been there in the Arusha community for a number of years. The wife of the retired Anglican bishop there established this mother's union group, and they identify the orphans who are in need and distribute the money to them. But we collect all the money and then forward that over to Arusha. Thank you, that's a great question. Okay. I'm uh, very glad to see you all out to hear more about what we're doing with Sister Cities, and particularly Arusha. We have um, a wonderful um, exchange with students, and I'm going to pretty much focus on the exchange that we have with St. Joseph. It's right as you go on your way to Ngoro Crater. So um, going into uh, the National Park, right before you get there, you pass the, um, I'm just trying to um, help you understand the geographic of where it sits. Um, there's. Um, an area where they have a cultural center. Right past the cultural center on the right is the St. Joseph School. And um, it's a school of 175 students. They're continuing trying to grow. They need about 200 to be sustaining. Sure. They need about 200 to be sustaining. Um, what we were able to do as um, Dr. Thornton had said is exchange with students at Riverside High School early seven o'clock in the morning they get up and they actually are um, talking to students in Arusha and it's about two in their afternoon. The school that we're going um, through with the exchange is an uh, after school program so after school they have an extended day to about five o'clock in the afternoon and so they're um, anxious to see American students, of course, and um, anxious to hear about our school day and what, you know, um, what our, our students have to look forward to. A lot of them ask questions regarding um, college. They do want to study abroad, which would be here, <laughs> as opposed to us going over there. So um, a lot of the girls, um, I'll say they're uh, mostly uh, middle to high school girls in this school. Um, they call them forms instead of grades. So um, they have the middle to high school girls and they particularly um, are interested in sports. They have similar sports, volleyball, you know, basketball, um, but they also have um, more things like uh, the Roots and Shoots program. There, there's a lot of clubs that they have that they enjoy. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, okay, thank you. So um, when I went to Arusha uh, with my husband, we um, thank you, were able to um, also attend, or not attend, but um, see the Ngoro Crater. And the crater is, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Serengeti but uh, a lot of people haven't heard of the Ngoro Crater, and it's actually a volcano that collapsed, and it's um, about 2,000 square feet down and about 100 square miles uh, wide. So that's where that picture came from. I got to see them up and close, but I uh, want to give you, again, understanding about Tanzania, um, being an East African country near the uh, African Great Lakes region, you have Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and the Democratic of Republic um, to the west, with Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique to the south. And the country's eastern border is uh, by the Indian Ocean. And Kilimanjaro, which a lot of people have heard of, but they um, always associate it with uh, Kenya, is actually closer to, or it's in, actually, um, Tanzania. And you enter, uh, you can also enter in uh, through Kenya. Oops, going the wrong way. So again, I don't know if you've seen a picture, but just for those that may not have, a, uh, Tanzania is in the eastern side of Africa. 
And here's a map of um, where I went. <laughs> I actually was able to go to most of the cities, um, the larger cities like Dodoma, um, Dar es Salaam, Zanzibar, and uh, Moshi, and Arusha. So if you, I don't see, okay. So Arusha is right here. And this is, um, let's say, hmm. so in Dar, which is like the main city, the Dome is the capital now. It, want, it once was not. It was Dar. Um, it's a six-hour drive, and I was actually able to drive the whole way um, with family, and we were able to see the countryside. It was just magnificent. Um, but the elevation is very high. So let's say it was about uh, this time of year, it's their winter. So it was about 70-ish uh, in Dar. And in Arusha, I would say about 60, uh, you know, um, maybe like 58, 60. So it was kind of cool. But during the day, it would rise up to about 70. So. so I'm sure you've um, gotten information that it was um, originally called Tanganyika, Tanzania, and um, Zan Zanzibar, they were separate countries. And um, in 64, they formed the United Republic of Tanzania. And just to give you an understanding, it's about this twice as the size of uh, California. So Arusha has a population over 400,000, and it's, again, been in sister city since 1991. And, um, one thing I like to say about Arusha is that um, it's a very thriving, bustling city. Um, there's universities there, so some parts of it remind me of our area um, with uh, the university being open, such as uh, Duke would be, or even Central kind of open to the city. So. Um, it's a rich mosaic of cultures, including the Maasai people. It lies in a tropical beauty at the base of the um, Kilimanjaro, and it uh, joins in, um, join us in learning more about it. And I do have tea. I, I brought the tea, so you can taste the tea. Um, this is going on into the Ngoro Crater. I had done this presentation for someone else, but um, let's see. Okay, so I wanted to show you the pictures. We will um, just proceed to show you my visit to the St. Joseph School. I uh, thank the gentleman for helping me. They have the projector upside down, so I'm glad that he was able to figure it out. Um, again, this is, um, as you enter into the school, it's the, again, Catholic Archdiocese of Arusha, and it's... Um, Okay, this is not working. Oh, I know now what I have to do. It's not, whoops, it's not clicking? No. I can do it from here. I can just sit here. Okay. You can just click under the arrow. Right. Just go to the next. You have to look up there. Yeah, you have to talk in here. You have to have two tasks. Okay. Multitasking. Okay. So, as we enter into the school, let me see if I can make this bigger. I'm trying, I am, and I'm trying to move my finger and not look. I can tell you. Why don't I move it and you tell me when? You want to do that? Okay. Okay. All right. So we're entering into the school, and this is the Bussar. It's the um, office, um, the Bussar's <laughs> office. And now we're um, actually um, conversating with the sister Ndito, who is the headmistress. I'm sorry. Who's the headmistress of the school? Tony and I, and there's the headmistress, and she's asking us to log our names into her book. There's their president. Let's see, just giving you an idea of what's in the office there. 
Okay, so now we're having a tour of the grounds. So we're actually approaching um, one of the buildings that when they purchased the land, I would say they just got there maybe nine, ten months ago. And when they purchased it, um, they had this building, a two-story building they were very excited about. But then they realized that there was damage to the building. So um, it's settling. So a lot of the buildings are made with limestone. Okay? And um, over time, it, it just decays. And so it's cracking and settling terribly. Um, just like in Durham. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it, it, this is just a lot of the damage I'm showing you um, of the building decaying. But the sad part is that this was an opportunity for them to grow the school even larger because of the extra classrooms and the science lab. And they were going to have the computer um, classes there as well. So um, they're just now um, looking at the other buildings there. So now we're approaching, oops. <laughs> Woo, this is a tax thing, right? Okay. Let me get out of the way. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's just this. And my day <laughs> okay so these are water tanks and there are other issues um, with the settling of the buildings and so forth but the water um, the city pro provides water to this school uh, three times a week and um, the water unfortunately is here so they can't have it like running water you know in the, in the bathrooms or in the so it, it, it's a it's a big um, effort to get this going but they have um, that water tank there, but that's the only one. And they actually need all of those tanks up like that so that they can use the facilities um, with running water. So this is um, not uh, the only place that has that issue, but um, there are also the wash basins there, and they're not able to use those as well because of the water not running. But um, here's the kitchen. <laughs> And I thought that was so interesting because I haven't seen that but in pictures before. So it was very um, interesting to see that they're cooking the meals for the girls. <laughs> yes. And, and actually, um, I would say a lot of the um, food preparation is done with charcoal. And um, they make their own charcoal. You'll see as you travel, you know, charcoal just available by the ton. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to say something? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, it's available for purchase from individuals that actually prepared the charcoal. So um, it's very interesting to me. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, Cosmos here, oh, okay, let me get this back. These are the children coming to speak to us but, oh, I lost the picture. No. <laughs> Too faint. This is, yeah, this move forward. This is the, um, the cafeteria table and chairs. And there's Cosmos. He is, um, to the left, he is the after school teacher who um, also coordinator who does Roots and Shoots and Leaps. I don't know if you're familiar with those programs as well but he's um, the coordinator for our cyber exchange. <coughs> and these are the students. And as um, Dr. Thornton was talking about the uniforms, uh, this is an example of not the uniforms that we make, but at St. Joseph, um, what I was told was that the age group is what you're seeing here. So this group of children are the younger group of children. 
Um, and this group are the um, girls actually getting ready to graduate. So they're wearing the red and blue. Okay. How many in the school? It's 175 right now. And they're trying to grow. And the class starts from like elementary to high school? Well, no, this actually is like a middle school middle. to high school. And um, their high school, to me, okay, so they're called forms, and the grades would go up to um, form six. But according to ours, so form four would pretty much be our 12th grade. But form 11 and, I mean, uh, five and six are what they need in order to go to university. So how you could think of that, but it's like a supplementary to. So in terms of curriculum, are they kind of comparable with uh, the US in terms of science? And science? I, I wouldn't say totally. Um, in in no. some respects, they are. Yeah. But we had, and that's a good question. Um, we did an exchange with a biology teacher at Riverside, Miss uh, Micah Hunter. And we were able to exchange where our students were and actually um, the 7 a, uh, 730 AM class at Riverside was the um, English as a second language student. So they were just coming in from Latin America, actually, mm -hmm. and this was their class. So mm -hmm. it was a very interesting exchange that we had here in the US, students from Latin America, that we were exchanging with students here in St. Joseph. And as they talked about their culture, it was similar to the students here that we had. So that was just one year, we had, or one um, semester, we did have that exchange. And they were on the cells and forming a cells and so some of, they understood what our students were doing and of course our students. So they're pretty much on par. But I wouldn't say, um, you know, so one for one, right? So the ninth grade may not be like the ninth grade there, but they eventually, by the time they finish, they're, they're pretty much on par. Where did you get this? They're donated. Um, a lot of it, uh, the archdiocese does uh, supply a lot of their um, materials. But um, again, a lot of things are lacking. You know, they have it, but it's it's not plentiful. <laughs> okay, so I, and I'm not a photographer, so forgive me with my pictures. Um, so it starts from. Form three, to, from three to form six. Yeah. Five and six are, are very few students are in form five and six right now. They don't have very many. So three and four is the majority of the students, the makeup of the students. And so this is just us getting ready to have the conversations. Um, they, I was introduced to them. They had stood up and, and welcomed me and all, all spoke in English. You know, they speak very well. So again, Swahili and English is the primary language. So English is taught in school. Um, so I just was greeting them and thanking them for coming. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. Um, this happens to be one of the students I do the exchange with. She's just one of the several. Uh, obviously, in front of a Skype session, I can't really, let me just say this. We have projectors like this, right? So I could do a whole room of people where they're only looking at one laptop and they're communicating through that one laptop. So I typically will only see about five or six faces at a time. And sometimes the teacher will walk around and try to show everyone. So they have internet? They do, but it's limited. So electricity is limited, right? So they're not on solar power. So their power can also be cut off by the city in the middle of the day. Um, so it, it's, it's limited. Right. OK, so this is just us talking. So and We've supported them, um, you know, to some extent. Um, we have had 
very successful sessions, but we have had sessions where the kids are there at seven in the morning and we can hear the children, but we can't see them and that's fine. But then, bloop, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And so we have to wait to another day that lines up with our student schedule. And so it, it makes it difficult. But they're, of course, very appreciative. And Edmodo was what Dr. Thornton was referring to. Edmodo, those of you in the public school system know that that is an authorized Facebook-like um, program that the students can use. And so a lot of the students in Arusha are connected to Edmodo. So they'll send their questions and then our students will write back to them. And so uh, actually the pictures aren't too much more of, and those are the actual students I, I exchange with. There's others, but they weren't there for the picture. And then this is their play yard, I guess they, they call it. They had the volleyball and they were asking because they didn't have nets for the volleyball and um, and so that she is the president or uh, uh, the chair, the chair of the um, Roots and Shoots, all of the programs that they do after school, she's the chair. So she wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one with me. <laughs> she, I mean, she literally approached me. I didn't even know they had a chair, you know. So leadership is taught, so that's good. And so she gave me some insight to understand more about how I can engage them, you know, with our students and who I can look for at Riverside to kind of connect with them specifically. More of our conversations in the last year have been more exploratory and you know uh, introductory like, but now we want to work on this year doing projects. There is a collaboration with the Riverside here and? Yes, and Sister Cities, I'm coordinating the I collaboration. See. I see. Mm -hmm. Are your students comfortable with the computer? So yes, they're very savvy, <laughs> surprisingly. They know the latest everything, you know, the latest <laughs> music, movies, they know what's going on. So when they have the time, but they may have 15 minutes a day and that's it, you know. So they don't, of course, have the time or luxury our students have um, at home, you know. So they, they, this is a boarding school. I, sh I should mention that again, that this is a boarding school. So they are here, you know, until the holidays and then they go home and they come back. But, you know, of course, home, they don't have any of this, but, because um, a lot of them come from the villages. So, um, this is a computer room, and unfortunately, it's like, oh, they have plenty of computers. But maybe 10 of them work, so. <laughs> they, they use them, you know, um, for other purposes, but there's Win 98, they're not on XP. So, <laughs> they're behind, um, and they're, they're trying to um, bring the computers up to speed. Oh, that's just some parts. But that's, that's it. That was, again, my visit to St. Joseph. And anyone else have questions? Okay. So um, the program Roots and Shoots uh, and LEAF, they do have some interaction with them about sustainable agriculture. They um, actually started a compost program with them. Um, it's kind of, so they have little buckets, little, I'm so sorry, <laughs> little buckets, like little trash pails that they use, um, and they're colorful. And they were left maybe a year ago, and they're all gone because people think that they're colorful, and they just take them. So um, they, they've had programs that have uh, worked well where they were able to, um, like I said, they just moved here maybe nine, ten months ago. They were in another site that they actually had a full working garden that actually fed the students. So um, one beautiful thing is that um, they have a lot of vegetation. I mean, the um, produce and you know um, vegetables, fruits is plentiful. But when you don't have water and the water source is limited that's when they have a problem. So at this site, it was a bigger site, the church thought it was best to move them. They are having a major water issue that they can't you know, actually have a garden because they, they need just enough to, you know, for themselves. So this is becoming a problem right now. They're, they're dealing with that. And the church is aware and they're working on it, but it's, it's something that 
needs to happen for them. That's a good question. In um, before, so I went in the month of July, and um, before I went, let me see, April, May, it was complete rain to the point of floods. Um, I, I don't know the number, but it, it that is their rainy season, April, May time frame. And I mean, I was concerned that you know about malaria and so forth when I got there. I was hoping that it would have dried up by the time because the rain had rained so much. It was you know, several feet high, and um, by the time I got there, everything was dried out in July, so, but April, May is their strong rainy season. I think it rained once when I was there, and it was just like a summer shower, and it was over. So people don't hardly flood. They do, um, and when I was in Dar es Salaam, I saw a lot of that, but I didn't see it in Arusha. So, but those are good questions, and that's something, um, Right now, our project that they've asked us to work with is clean water. That's what they want to um, have us work on is clean water and litter. They want to um, have programs where they can encourage others to care about their surroundings and clean up after themselves. So those are the two pr projects that they've asked us to talk about. But the clean water will be my um, biology, you know, talking with the science classes on how we can work on that. But yeah, the harvesting, I, I really didn't see that, but that's a good question. I can follow up. Anyone else? Has anyone explored the possibility of digging a well? I'm sorry, a well? Like a well. A well for the school? Yeah, and what it would cost? I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. What I did ask uh, the headmistress to do, Sister Ndato, to actually do her research on what her needs were with the water and then bring that back to us. So, um, but our focus is the students. If the students don't have water, you know, it's, but our, you know, I'm mostly trying to do the exchange between our schools and um, that's an infrastructure issue, right? So, but I have asked her to at least present that and maybe Sister Cities in, in uh, collaboration with another organization could do something to help. But I'll, I'll present that. She's still bringing her report to me, so I don't have it. Okay. Anyone else? So let me ask you about the, um, so that's a Catholic school. Yes. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a Catholic school. So then the, diocese or the archdiocese is located? So that's a good question. Apparently, um, that diocese specifically for St. Joseph is not there. It's um, in Ireland. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. But they are, ex there is a new archdiocese of Arusha City that's going to take over the school. So right now it's St. Joseph, and later it will be called something else. But it's apparently just a name change. I mean, it, it's more than that, right, if the archdiocese starts changing. Yes, because I was going to say a diocese or an archdiocese then would probably assume or should assume the bulk of the financial Exactly, and, and they are supposed to, they are supposed, but I think that's why there's this transition. I don't know, do you have comment on that? Do you know, okay. No, I, I, I think that they're, so I know that they're supposed to, but I think because of this transitioning is the issue, and I think that's why they're looking at an Arusha Archdiocese that will be more engaged, I guess you can say. Uh, maybe I didn't understand you well. Um, that means the school belongs to the orphans only or is a mix of uh, students? That's a good question. Um, a lot of the students are orphans, but um, most of the students have actually um, people that are sponsoring them, paying for them to be there. They have families and they go back to their family um, you know, during the holidays. So there are orphans as well there, but the prime, I don't think that they're primarily orphans. Okay. 
uh, uh, those ones who have parents, they pay uh, school fees. Yes. Like tuition. Yes. Yes. And maybe one thing that we should clarify is that this is one of several projects that the Arusha Committee is undertaking. And the one that uh, we're talking about really had its genesis in a cyber exchange. Exactly. So these other things that we're now looking at associated with the school and the water and all of that, those have come as a result of the visit that she made, which has kind of expanded her understanding of the situation with the school. And I was trying to make sure that we weren't confusing you about the orphan project, which we do have with a totally different group. Exactly. And that's a separate project that we have had with the Arusha Committee. So that's not situated with St. Joseph's. St. Joseph's was a cyber project. The orphans project was growing out of the Episcopal Diocese. And that's totally different. And then the, the, um, the uh, sewing group is a totally different project where we're trying to get them working with their cottage industry and making of the uniform. So there are about four or five different things one that we did not actually show the pictures of, we also talked about, was the uh, health, the clinic, which we're very, okay. very proud of. That's our, probably the latest project, if I'm sure. Yes. And it's the one that we entered into actually through a grant that we were given through the Gates Foundation, yes. uh, uh, African uh, Urban Poverty, Poverty Alleviation, Alleviation Program. Program. And so that was monies that we got to help support the beginnings of that uh, clinic. And we are now still working with it through the city to get it completed. So they're, they're independent projects. Yeah, so again, the Orphan Project was a, is a 12-year project. This is just a new cyber exchange with a different school. So um, it's talking about the clinic, it was exciting. I do have pictures of that, but I'll, I'll <laughs> spare you right now. <laughs> Um, the, the pictures of the clinic, um, they're actually finishing up. They should be done this month. And um, this is, that's a very interesting situation. They have multiple clinics throughout Arusha. I think they said it's about 50 something clinics. But only one clinic currently has an operating room for women um, that are pregnant. So our clinic is the second clinic in Arusha that will be for, um, uh, to operate on pregnant women. Our clinic will be the second one in the whole city. So the medical officer from the city of Arusha was very excited to see this happen. And um, you know, this is a big deal because it's for women and children right now. There are plans later for it to expand into other things as well. But this one um, that we were able to participate and make happen is very vital to their city. Center, is that is that okay? Um, is Duke and University involved with that at all, or so Dr. Thornton can talk I about that? So we are just now at the point where we've been asked if we could provide some resources to help equip the clinic and provide medical uh, expertise to help train the health. Um, my niece was in Moshi, which is about an hour from Arusha, with the Duke Global Health <coughs> Program. And she knows that they are interested now in having some health professionals to come back. She is Liberian, but she has an interest in improving health throughout the diaspora. Uh, and we probably will want to involve some others from the Duke Global Health community. Uh, I don't know if you know Dr. David Vollmer. He is another physician who's been very involved in improving health. Um, the New York Times recently had a huge article about a device that he developed, which normally costs thousands of dollars here, 
We use it to look at a woman's cervix to see if she has signs of cervical cancer. And the thing usually costs thousands of dollars. Well, he put together like a bicycle lens from a bicycle light, and it, the, the thing costs $10, basically. But it's gonna be wonderful because cervical cancer is totally curable as long as you find it and identify it quickly. So I'm hoping to have him help us also. He's helped us already um, with the links to get um, supplies to uh, Haiti this summer. He took some things over for us. So we're just starting to pull together that medical expertise piece of it. And of course, as you can understand, we have to be asked. We can't just say, here, you need this, right? Yeah, but we're really just so happy that the city is completing the project, completing the construction, and now we're looking for ways to get it properly equipped. There's a point I wanted to bring up to you, though. The point that um, Mrs. Aaron, uh, and Galegua brought up about this will have an operating room in it. And I said, well, why do you need an operating room for pregnant women? Because normally, you know, you have spontaneous vaginal delivery and that's the end, right? But you have to remember, we're talking usually about women who get active prenatal care throughout, you know, the nine months of pregnancy, who've been taking vitamins, you know, supplements throughout pregnancy. And then there's one other factor, which I don't know how prominent this is in um, the country of Tanzania, but we also have women who have a different uh, anatomical physiology because of the initiation ceremonies that are done. So that probably means that many of them will have to have cesarean sections rather than being able to have a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. Okay. Thank I'll you end, so yeah. much. I'll end now and just um, let you know, we do have now, Sister Cities of Durham is opening or started a youth council, and our youth council will be engaging as well, the Riverside High School, the youth council will engage with us to um, exchange with the students, and our hope is to get some students to travel to Arusha to meet the students in both ways, you know, from Riverside and also from uh, uh, St. Joseph to bring them here to um, Durham, so that's our goal. So let's thank, thank everybody you. from Sister City for this wonderful program. Thank you so much.